Everyone, welcome back to the Spiritual Nomad Podcast. Um, we have Mark Gladman on the show today. And um, Mark and I were chatting in the direct messages about faith in terms of the post that I made about um, having some sort of deconstruction and reconstruction, and that sparked a conversation. And uh, so we're able to finally link up here. Mark is in Australia. So we're, you know, we had to figure out and do a little bit of, you know, uh, time calculations to get a time together, but we're here and chatting now. So Mark, thanks for carving out some time of your morning, my afternoon, <laughs> yesterday <laughs> for you. Uh, thanks for oh, no, carving out some time. Or tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, you're tomorrow, right? I'm tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, thanks. you're in my yesterday. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it, isn't it good that there's no space and time in God? That, that this, right. That, it'd make this so much easier, wouldn't it? That's so <laughs> true. So that's, I always think that's so bizarre. I had a t conversation the other day with a gentleman in India, and it was a right. similar thing, trying to figure out timing, you know, and it was like, I recorded with him at like uh, nine o'clock at night, my time, but it was like 10 in the morning tomorrow is to, I don't know how all of that works, but thanks man for, for carving out some time for an episode with me. Pleasure. So uh, we've been talking on a little bit before we started recording here and you've been sharing just a little bit about what you do and sharing about um, just the, the city that you live in, the town that you live in and um, how you have entered into almost a sort of like a, being like a town chaplain in a, in a sense. Um, and I'm curious, like with your, how does that line up? Is that something that um, we, that you have pursued in a particular way? Like what's, what do you do during the day? You do a lot of stuff. You have a, an, a, uh, a blog, right. That you do some of this stuff with um, and you've been pursuing um, this in, in other ways online and maybe in person is, ministry chaplaincy has that been a part of your your life for a while or is this something yeah, new that's coming yeah up? it has uh in fact my my day job that pays the bills i'm a chaplain in a school okay um so it's a school of about two thousand students um and i look after the senior school so that's your 10 11 and 12 about 620 to 50 students wow uh, and um, we'd have about a good 50 50 or so staff in the senior school i think or thereabouts um so I spend my days uh, doing pastoral care um, with the student body. Um, we're a Christian school um, in the Anglican or in your case, Episcopal uh, tradition. Um, I'm not an ordained Episcopal priest or anything like that, Anglican priest. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm a lay mm -hmm. person or whatever they, you know, what they call it. But um, so pastoral care with students, uh, a couple of chapels a week, and I also write and deliver the Christian living curriculum, which is a subject that all year 10 and 11 students do. Wow. Um, and that's been a great joy because, you know, talking about the stuff that we'll probably end up talking about later, there's been avenues to start to share that with young people. It's been eye opening for them yeah. about who God is and what God's about and the place of faith and spirituality in everyday life, whether I end up being believers or not is not necessarily the um, the end game for me. The end game is helping them see the value mm. in the spiritual traditions um, and how it can bring them to a place where they might develop that who knows in the future. But for right now, just getting their head around it and seeing its value. Um, so that's, that's, um, but in terms of what's happening here in the community, it's, it's not anything that I've done intentionally except be me. Yeah and be um, what I think God wants all of us to be in our localities. And that is just the presence of, of God in community. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of uh, saints here in the, when we're having a chat before, we have a lot of businesses and uh, restaurants, cafes, uh, you know, locally owned stores and, and that sort of thing in my little community here at Burley beach. And, um, and I'm at the North Burley. There's a South Burley end that's, that is very, very village like up this northern end. It's a little bit less so, only about a, um, a mile up the road uh, in terms of its built upness. Yeah. But there's a much more connected vibe between, as I was saying to you, the businesses are share resources with each other and sell other, each other's products through their own avenues. And um, of course, I get around to all these places and I talk to the proprietors and um, hang out in their spaces and get to know them really well. They all know what I do. Yeah. And I suppose that there's this, um, 
what's the word? Goodwill that's yeah. built up. This this uh, understanding that um, I, they can it's trust too, yeah. I suppose. And um, in time, you start to make connections with them. That you know, when COVID hit, um, it really hit the businesses here really hard. It's a high tourist area, and our borders were closed with the other states for quite some time. Um, we and there was a number of weeks there where, unless you were in a um, a business that was required, you had to close down or reinvent. And a lot of the people around here had to reinvent themselves. Uh, the gin distillery started making hand sanitizer. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, the brewery, uh, the brewery on the corner. This one's new, but the other one um, started doing home drop. Uh, mm. Some of my favourite cafes along here started doing home drop. Um, yeah. And then started doing things like we'll make a meal, a frozen dinner. And we'll deliver it to you. You can stick it in your freezer and you can eat it later. Yeah. Um, and so I was getting around to these places as I was able um, and just making sure I, I care for these people. So I was making yes. sure they were okay. But there's that sense of, you know, sharing real love, right? Yeah. Um, with, yeah. with other people. So that sort of built up, I suppose, some sort of connection and goodwill where they see me now as a kind of the sort of person they can trust and, than spleen with and talk life with and um it's probably in its very early stages i mean i've been here permanently for a year and on and off for the two years before that yeah um half time so uh you know it's in the very early stages in terms of connection and stuff but it has caused me to do a lot of thinking and praying about well what is um mm -hmm. what does this community need um, yeah uh, there's a there's an Anglican church, uh, Episcopal church, uh, back down in the main sort of area a mile down the road. At this end, there doesn't seem to be, there's no, not really any churches about the place. And it's not that I'd necessarily go about planting a church, but seeking opportunity within the spaces that are here. And there's lots of them Yeah. where people could intentionally connect and share stories and, um, and grow together. Yeah. Um, yeah. So very early stages about what that might look like and, and how I can be, of, and mostly how I can be of service to the community in that way that's only just dawned on me is starting to happen. Yeah. I love that. And I love that, you know, and the reason I wanted to kind of start with that is just to show like what this can look like in a real space in real time as we like, because I think the purpose of faith in a lot of ways is how we live and move and have our being, right? Like how right. we just go to the pub, how we do these things. How do we, go out to eat the conversations we have who we befriend and i love that that is you seem to have that embodiment from what i've just my take from talking with you here you seem to have that sort of embodied spiritual practice of the community and the people around you. that's one of the first things that we talked about uh and so as you are a a, a chaplain for i was a youth pastor by the way so yeah. I know a little bit about working with probably in a different way than you do about working with, uh, you know, teens or working with people. Um, but I'm curious, even in yourself, as you've pursued a path of seeking to, to help other people or to walk with other people, uh, that comes obviously, maybe not so obviously from like a faith tradition and a faith background. What was some of the origins for you as far as like faith foundations and formations, you know? Is that something that you were uh, born into or later in life? Well, it's interesting. You, you, you guys use the term mongrel when you talk about dogs in the States. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so a, a mongrel in Australia is like bits of this, bits of that, or bits of, you know? Yeah. Like bit of this dog, bit of that dog, bit of that dog. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in, terms of, in terms of my spiritual development, I'm a mongrel. I'm a bitzer. So I was born into a family that had a, a connection to the Anglican uh, Episcopal tradition um here in australia and so i grew up um going to church christmas and easter and my grandmother particularly took it very seriously and the story goes that it was my third christmas or second christmas so i was about two and a half and the the, the priest disappeared after the the prayers and stuff to go up the back to come to the little altar that was like a puppet show thing i don't know what you mm -hmm. call those not an altar the um pulpit yeah uh, and it came out to preach and we was, had still just we were finishing singing a hymn or something and the guy came out and I turned to my dad, I was standing on the chair and I turned to my dad and I said, dad, I want to be like that guy up there. <laughs> and my dad said, well, sit down and listen and you'll be able to learn what to do. Right. So this was two <laughs> and a half. When I was about six, I have a memory and other people do too, of me doing communion services with my teddy bears 
No the, way. Yeah, from the prayer book, um, making little altars out of Lego and stuff and, <laughs> um, and doing stuff like this, right? Um, what happened, uh, I was taken for confirmation when I was 13, which is what good, you know, first couple families do. And um, my dad was defense, so we moved around a lot. And so this year of my confirmation classes and my confirmation was done with um, a military chaplain who is still a friend of mine to this day. Mm. Uh, he became a bishop and the bishop of the defense forces later, and he's retired now. Uh, Len Ecott, lovely guy. And Len um, took me through my confirmation. I took it really seriously. I thought, if I'm making a commitment to God in front of all these people, this is, you know, I gotta, I'm going to own this. This is going to yeah. be real. When we finished that year, I made my confirmation, um, and later that year, Dad was posted to Canberra, so we relocated, and I started taking myself to church. Um, so my family weren't regular church goers. They went through the time of confirmation. We relocated sort of back to normal, but I wanted to take this seriously. Yeah. But what happened next was really interesting. So I'm about 13, 14 years old at this point, and I really started to think about what is faith, what is spirituality. I went in this really intense three and a bit year search where I studied, um, I look back now as a, someone who's a, you know, done some academic, a lot of academic work. And I think, man, as a 13, 14 year old, 15, 16, 17 year old, this is, this is serious. Yeah. Uh, I was looking at things like Buddhism and uh, Shinto and Islam and Judaism and Christianity and some of the other faith traditions around that and some of the other isms and philosophies. Cause I wanted to know if I'm going to take this whole thing seriously, I want to do it seriously. Yeah. Um, so I, I did that. Uh, and at the end of the day, the Jesus story was the one that was still completely compelling, um, which we might touch on a bit later. Yeah. Um, but that's, so that's the tradition that through which God made sense to me. That's how I'd explain it now. I wouldn't have explained it like that back then. Mm -hmm. um, but I still wanted to be a rebellious kid, right? Rebellious teenager. So if I was going to take Jesus seriously, how do you rebel? Will you change churches? Mm. So my family were Anglican. Uh, so I ended up in a church of Christ. Um, okay. So, you know, we go on, you know, uh, very fundamentalist. And in fact, my first, so I, I chased a girl and that's how I ended up in a church. And Kylie and I <laughs> dated for about three years, but her father, who was a Jamaican guy, um, uh, was also my first Bible teacher and pastor mm. for many years on. And again, uh, Kylie, her brother, Jason, who I played a lot of music with, played reggae with Jason for a number of years and, um, and still jam with him from time that. to time. Oh yeah. That's a I real mean, Jamaican, know, man. If you're going to play man, reggae, you know. Well, listen, Kylie's mum, who is um, Australian English, uh, learned how to make curry goat for Delroy. And I, so I've had curry goat, man. I'm, I'm, you yeah. know, I learned how to speak patois and, and the works. <laughs> it was so cool. But Delroy was also my first Bible teacher. And uh, I'm grateful for him because mm. the, the, I know scripture today because of him and the things that he did with me. In that first couple of years and by the time I finished high school I'd already done a degree in biblical studies um, that I was doing on the side Wow! Um, and so I sort of then I, I, by then I'd entered into ministry I was doing youth work in the church and, and that sort of stuff uh, I started a music school to pay the bills but I was still doing a lot of work in schools with young people in churches and so on mm -hmm. um, long story short I was a couple of denominational cuts along the way but ended up within the charismatic movement and we're in a church movement here called Christian Outreach Center, which is now called International Network of Churches, uh, which are now a worldwide international um, charismatic church where I was ordained mm. um, and was um, understanding God through that way, which was in some ways my first uh, eye opening to mysticism. If yeah. you want to, they wouldn't call it that. Um, but no, you know, that's, charismatic that's what it Christianity is, is definitely, and that's a little weird, you know, wrapping a little bit before we started. And, and that's yeah. me being in the vineyard churches, vineyard church right. movements is very charismatic. And it's, you know, uh, they don't understand it sometimes in that way, but it's very informed by mysticism. As a matter of fact, Absolutely. one of our, uh, I'm on like a group for vineyard preachers and teachers. I still have my ordination. That's who we're really, we're, we're doing all of our stuff with. Um, and John Wimber, who started the Vineyard Churches, uh, and then a guy named Lonnie Frisbee, who really was a part of that with the Calvary Chapel movement. I don't know if those names ring a bell or not, but they're listed on Wikipedia as Christian mystics. 
And I'm like, right. okay. yes. So I am. <laughs> it's so funny. I'm like, all this has come around, you know, full That's circle. It. And now nobody, whenever I go to conferences, uh, you know, can argue with me about mysticism because, you know. Because Wikipedia says so. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's the, it's no, the, that's, the law. Isn't that interesting, right? How, yes, yes. Um, w- there's no reinventioning of the wheel with God because God is. Um, yes. We just, we call it different things. Right. Um, yeah. And because we haven't experienced it or maybe a couple of generations have missed it, um, doesn't, it hasn't been there before. Right. Uh, right. For sure. So, um, so you ended up in CRC and, and um, what happened then was really interesting. Um, I was there for about six years um, as a youth pastor and I was a chaplain in the school <clears throat> that was connected to the church. Um, and my, coach, my co-chaplain, who was also one of my mentors, Ian Feeney, all these beautiful people that when yeah. I tell this story come up, you know, Delroy and Elan and um, Ian. But Ian comes into the office one day and he goes, you look flat, what's going on? And I said, you know, man, I feel like a palm tree, uh, tall leaves, there's fruit, but I feel like my roots are really shallow. Mm. Um, I want to be like an oak, man. I want, I want the roots to really go deep. And he looked at me and just said, well, if it's roots you're looking for, maybe you need to go back to yours. And that's mm. all he said. I'm like, wow, what does that mean? So I really contemplated this for some time. And I decided there was two ways to take it. So I might as well take it both ways. So from where I was, I started to work back in my own understanding of the, my Christian tradition of my roots. So I worked back to my roots and then started to work forward from Jesus on the roots of, you know, from the roots of Christian tradition and, and where it went. Um, and they both met at um, the Episcopal church, the Anglican church. So I thought I, I need to maybe get back to that. And so I did. I um, ended up with a job in a church in Brisbane and ended up as a ministry consultant for the diocese here um, for a number of years. Mm. Um, and then I had this earth shattering moment where after being away from it for so long, I opened up a prayer book and I started reading this prayer book, which through my, you know, fundamentalist and charismatic days, I've been told, oh, that's just, you know, repetition and it's vainglory and it's, you know, um, right. it's not biblical. And I'm reading this thing and I'm going, thanks to Dory, I'm looking at this and I'm going, this is all scripture. Mm. All this supposedly repetitious stuff and, you know, stuff that you say every week, it's all straight from scripture. Yeah. Wow. This is actually quite, you can't get more biblically based than this. Right. Um, and so uh, one of the things I, I discovered out of that was more, I'm looking through the prayer book, discover this morning and evening prayer. Mm. Um, and so I started to explore that. And I'm down in Canberra speaking at a school and a mate of mine who was the, um, uh, the chaplain there at the time says to me, so have you heard of St. Benedict? I'm like, no. Nah. Tell me about the St. Benedict. So he went and bought me a copy of the rule of St. Benedict and gave me a, a Glenn Stall book of daily prayer. And um, I fell in love with the daily office. And the more I read the rule, the more I started to see that this is really interesting. This is almost like Benedict is writing a guide for how to live the gospel in community. Mm. Um, and then I started to think, well, what would it look like if a guy who at the time married with two kids and a mortgage and a Harley and a dog living in the suburbs could they live this kind of life without having to run off to a monastery? Mm. And so in about 2010, the modern monk project was born, um, which is now monk and docks. Yeah. So, um, so started to explore living out the rule and a monastic rhythm of life. Um, as, as I was living out every day in, in community with my family. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's how I got to really digging into um, the, the more ancient uh, traditions, the wisdom of the desert mothers and fathers um, yeah. uh, and all this stuff, which really opened my eyes more to where I sit and continue to grow today. Yeah. So that's so is, the journey. Is that part of the, um, so we, we use the, obviously the buzz term right now is deconstruction in a lot of ways. Uh, but what I like to use in some of the ways is just a simple reevaluation or reformation of faith. And that takes some moving around of mental or theological furniture to do, you know, yep. some things got to go like, 
when you clean your garage, you don't throw everything away, but sometimes you take it out, you throw away the trash and you reorganize it. A lot of times that's the, the flow. Um, it, was that sort of the, the, the time that you began to explore other uh, in revisiting the roots, that was maybe the beginning of a reconstruction or was that part of a deconstruction or both or, or how was some of that time? Yeah, the, I, I think the deconstruction happened when I started to realize that. It probably been happening before that. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, I'm thinking of a time when um, we're in the charismatic church. So, I mean, that's the, the context of this. We uh, were having a prayer meeting with our pastors and our, one of our pastors came in and said that they, the, um, our, our church was on a corner with a roundabout. I, I don't know if you call them there, but yeah. it's sort of a big circle thing in the middle of four, like a crossroads so that you can yeah. easily navigate it. And they, the counselor just done it up with some nice rock work in different colors. And he came in and said, I, I think they've actually made a pentagram out of it. Mm. I think we need to pray over it. And I just simply That's a very said, charismatic observation and thing to do. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not bagging it. Um, sure. But, but I found myself in that moment, I looked up and I said, um, why? Yeah. And they looked at me, one of the pastors looked at me and went, what do you mean why? I said, well, if um, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world, I started to quote all these scriptures about God being great and awesome and wonderful and powerful and protective. I said, why do we yeah. have to go over and pray over a shape in the ground made with rocks? It's mm. got no power over us. Yeah. Yeah. And the response I got was, well, if you don't want to come with us, you can stay <laughs> inside. Uh. I was like, and I, and I did. I was yeah. like, no, that, that seems a bit silly to me. But as I sat there waiting for them to come back, I'm like, this makes no sense. Mm. If, if God is this powerful, why, why do we have to do that? Yeah. Well, we could pray it from in here. Why do yeah. we have to go out there and march around it? And, and again, I'm not, I'm not bagging those things. If that's, your, if that's the way that you engage with God, then more power to you. But I started to realize that there were a, a lot more questions than direct answers and pat answers. Yeah. And this is when I started to really read scripture for what it was, digging into context, you know, my, my exegesis and hermeneutics got much deeper, yeah. my um, reliance on original languages mm. and culture to understand the context of what's going on, particularly in the Jesus narratives um, and, you know, the teachings, um, appreciating and learning to appreciate the fact that, the Hebrew scriptures, are, you know, the book of the Jewish church and, um, and the Jewish community. And we do ourselves a little bit of a disservice if we try and tell them what we think it means first, mm, um, yeah. partic particularly in the way that Jesus taught from them and understood them from that context. So, right. uh, so there's a, a lot of this started to happen around about the same time. And I think that's why I felt the roots were shallow because suddenly I realized, wait, this could all fall over. Yeah. Any second. And it was all really based around the idea that of absolute truth. Mm. And I don't mean that God isn't an absolute in who God is, but the idea that we can box that up and say, well, this is exactly definitively what it is. Here it is served up um, on your drive through window. And you know, you're going to get every time you go through the window and order that thing. I started to realize that God can't be that. Right. If, if Jesus, if Jesus was right in talking about, you know, the wind goes where the wind goes and yeah. we have no idea where it goes or how it goes and how dare we try and tell it that if the <laughs> Celtic Christians could refer to the Holy spirit as the, the, the wild goose. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going glass. I mean, we, we do ourselves a huge disservice if we say, well, here's the God I serve and it's nicely, neatly packaged. Right. And you can have it for, for nine ninety nine sign on the line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's just God is so much bigger than that. And when, when the eyes open to a God that's bigger than that, the world opens up. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the depth and the love and the, the connectedness to all things and the connectedness of all things. And so, you know, um, occasionally with our year 11 students, um, I show them parts of Rob Bell's first um, presentation of Everything is Spiritual. Yeah, um, what a wonderful... And, Wonderful piece. You know, that, that quantum physics um, sounding so much 
like um, early Jewish poets. Yes. <laughs> and that's the line I usually stop at art and turn around and there's these kids going, wow. <laughs> Right. So here's these, these kids who are all, you know, a lot of them very scientific. I mean, we have, a, it's a very high uh, academic school. So there's a lot of, you know, science, math, uh, yeah. your focus. And you've just basically quoted them, well, shared with them quantum physics and Rob's been able to show them how, well, this is very similar to explaining what's going on in this perichoresis uh, yes. of God that's happening there, you know? So, um, if God's so much bigger than life, so much bigger and, and we are so much bigger. So that's been the journey since then is yeah. um, re reimagining. And when I say reimagine, I love the way Peter Enns puts it. This is not something that's making stuff up. This is re understanding and reorienting, reorienting ourselves to understand yeah. what God is and what God's about. You know, yeah. um, the, the scriptures are a description of people at various times and their understanding growing and changing and transforming. And, and I love the way Peter and says, you know, we do ourselves a huge disservice if we stop that tradition. Yeah. Um, and so I think what's happening, you know, this last, you know, decade or two where we've been seeing this deconstruction reconstruction thing happening is that very thing re-emerging in the church again, that re-understanding, re-evaluating um, what God is and who God is now and how we relate to that God and to each other because of that. Yeah, that's so good. How does that work with um, one of the initial things that I'm curious about is with your, uh, you know, grade 11 students and stuff, what are some of the conversations that typically come up from from Rob's work, I'm curious. Well, well, it's it's interesting because one of the first things I say at the start of U10 um, is one of the things I really want you to embrace in the next couple of years that I share this time with you is um, that God is not a man in the sky on a cloud waiting to throw thunderbolts at you when you kick your toe and swear. Mm. Uh, that's not what God's about. That's um, so good. And so, if we can get beyond that. Yeah. And understand that, that we start to, you know, think about what God could be if God is not limited to that man in the sky image. What does that look like? So what comes out of the, the you know, by that time, you know, year 11, in year 10, we've looked at uh, things like sexuality and that's a fun one. Yeah. Given tell me kids, about that. <laughs> given, given year 10 kids Song of Solomon to read. And yes. Really think that's about yeah. Um, <laughs> After they've been happened. told by other Christians that anything sexual is sin and wrong yeah. and bad yeah. and, and all of that, or even like what you said, I think that like the formation that you're having, because I think a big piece of a lot of this is not only people going through a sort of reformation or a, a re-embracing of that understanding how God evolves in our life and our awareness of God, but like how we are going to help walk younger people through that. Cause I think a lot of the, the deconstruction movement that kind of has a little unhealth going on in it right now is just a major backlash to the way that we were uh, told how to think through things, how to think we were, like you said, we were handed the nine ninety nine lunch special of God. And it's like anything other than that is, is, is wrong and bad and heretical. And, you know, uh, it, we're having a major you know, uh, reaction to that in a lot of ways. And I think that going forward is some of us heal from different things in our own self and relationship with God and others that we are able to impart to younger people, or even in my case, like I have two kids, how I raise them, um, mm -hmm. you know, how people who are youth that are a part of even our community and what we do, like that is a huge part in setting up a whole next iteration of generations to live and move and have their being, you know? And so I just want to just commend that sort of conversation that you're already bringing the kids in that stage of their life. It's well, radically we different. To. Yes. We, we have to remember, remember a number of years ago when I was still, um, uh, I can't remember when it was, but I remember someone saying, you know, everyone knows what Christians are against, but no one really knows what they're for. Yeah. Yeah. And when you were talking about the deconstruction movement just a moment ago and how there seems to be a quagmire of stuff, I think the trap that that deconstruction movement's fallen into perhaps is that they're focused on what they're against right. from the church. Yes. <laughs> so you had the church against, we're against this, we're against that. Now you've got the deconstruction movement saying we're against this, we're against that. 
um, I, I decided I wanted to try and be a voice that was saying, well, what are we for? Yes. What is God about? What, what, where does this mean? I could sit there and argue and, um, you know, and, and that's hard not to argue sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. It's hard not to throw your two cents in. Yeah. But at the same time, I want people to understand, well, what are we about? What are we for? Who do, who do we want to be? And what does God want us to be? And who is God? And, and when we're connected to this God, this abundant, I mean, live 1010 was a hashtag that I've used off and on over the years. And that really meant live a 1010 life, 10 out of 10, 100%, but also John 1010. I have come that you may have life and life in abundance. That was Jesus' mission. Yes. A full and abundant life. And when we understand that abundant life, eternal life, full life is about the best life now. And yeah. what Jesus was trying to do is to say, this is how we can, when you're connected to understanding God's kingdom. Yeah. All right. Uh, and what it means to live in God's way of doing and God's way of being. It's like saying, this is, this is how we connect yeah. with that movement of God in the world. And I've, I've had the joy of saying to some kids who would say that they're atheists and to say to them, you know, um, I think you're more a part of the, the God movement in the world than you think you are. Yeah. Uh, whether you like it or not, simply by what you're doing. Right. Um, by, by the actual life that you're leading and living, which by the way, is how Jesus said, you'll know who's actually yeah. living in this. And yeah. I use the kingdom of God in terms of like, I, I hang out, I run with a lot of folks who, you know, are in more uh, spiritual, but not religious movements or different things. So, you know, I talk about like the kingdom of God is, is this eternal flow of perfection that when we enter into this state, it becomes completeness in our life. Yes. You know, yes. that's what we're talking about here. And it's like, when you have that sort of awareness, so many more people are included <laughs> than what we Absolutely. have previously thought, you know? So it's, you know, for, we do a social justice unit with our year 11s um, and with our year 10s. And one of the things we say in both of those units is, um, you know, the core message of Jesus was very simple love God and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yeah. And if you look in between the lines with other uh, parts of J Jesus teaching, it's actually loving people is the way you love God because yes. if, if God is in them and God is in me and I am in you and you are in us and us are then that, well, guess what? You know, we're all one um, back to the quantum physics again. We're all somehow interrelated and interconnected. So, um, you know, this idea that, simply sharing a sandwich with the homeless guy across the street here, Steve, um, that activity is a part of the flow of God. It's a part of that, you know, loving God and loving others. I love the God in Steve yeah. um, at the risk of sounding like I'm being, you know, pantheistic, but um, I, I love how Richard Raw says the differentiation is panentheism. That's um, God I'm, is in all. Um, yes. Yes. You know, so if the image of God is in Steve, um, you know, Jesus said, when you do this to the least of these, you do it to me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, that's, that's really what it's about. And if it's as simple as that, I think um, uh, my, my girlfriend sent me a note last, just last night um, as uh, I was going off to sleep. And it didn't come through to this morning because Messenger had some issues yesterday. But she sent me Galatians 6 two which simply says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And she sent, this is everything. This is such a simple message. Yeah. And then yeah. carry one another's burdens. And this way you fulfill the law of Christ. When we look at Acts 2 and Acts 4, we see communities where no one had lack because everyone was looking out for each other. And yeah. I think one of the for want of a better term, sins of the Christian community over the years is this individualism, this, uh, are you saved? Are you going to heaven? Yes. One of the things I learned out of the whole Benedictine thing and monasticism thing is that, you know, monks aren't about salvation for themselves. They're about salvation for the whole community. Yeah. They're actually yeah. seeking each other's salvation. Right. Um, As each a other's selfless sacrifice, imaging the life of Jesus. Who would have thought? <laughs> And, and that whole, you know, perichoresis in God, that the, the servant, yeah, it's, yes. it's, yeah, who would have thought exactly? Right. Who would have <laughs> thought that? So with that, um, actually just coming to me, maybe it'd be fun to talk about how Jesus has taken maybe different forms in your formation throughout the years. I know a lot of people, even speaking from my own personal experience, not just even the folks that I run with, but like what Jesus meant to me throughout the years, as I look at these different iterations of faith, has sort of evolved or changed and and 
some of the simple teachings of Jesus become the paramount things that I think was supposed to be, you know, whenever I was really yeah. hyper into like Calvinism and reform stuff, I'm like, forget the simple stuff of loving your neighbors yourself. Where's the real hard theological nut to crack? You know what I mean? And you're kind of like on this like pious sort of, uh, you know, um, mission uh, to do all of the academics of, it, you know, but so Jesus takes a lot of different forms. And for me, it's like the simplest messages now become the hardest ones. Uh, but how has that looked like in your life? How's Jesus and the life of Jesus and understanding Christ and some of the, the language of the universal Christ that Richard Rohr talks about and how all of these, uh, the, the life of Jesus and the understanding of Christ, how that's evolved and changed and formed the way you live. The, the first thing that changed for me was the voice mm. of, of Jesus, um, which moved from this hard line, harsh finger pointing um, voice to one that was soft mm. uh, and, and more gentle, frustrated at times, um, but was really trying to get across this point of what this kingdom was and help us understand what that was. So the, the, that was the first thing that was really noticeable to me. I'd read the scriptures and, uh, you know, read um, the red letters and I'm not necessarily suggesting they were the actual words that Jesus spoke at the time. They're probably not, but you know, you put that voice in your head of what it sounds like and it was got, got way more gentle mm. um, and way more soft. And that actually changed the way I shared the message when I was preaching. Um, it, 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 it changed. Yeah. huge uh it changed the way i went about um you know we're talking about my community here before i think one of the reasons why that connections happened is because it's not just they can trust me but they're not intimidate or not not intimidate is not the word they're not um they, they know i'm not going to jump down their necks and try and shove a bible down it you know yeah um yeah. they know that i'm serious about loving them first um mm -hmm. and that i sincerely care for them and enjoy their their friendship and that connection um, so there was that, uh, which sort of changed for me too. Um, I suppose th people like, um, Kenneth Bailey, uh, who's, a, a, a new Testament scholar who, um, has done a lot of work with the parables and understanding the parables in their context. Um, and, you know, getting into some of the backstories of some of these things that were going on when Jesus shared these parables and sayings. Um, that started to change my understanding of things too, obviously. Suddenly the parables weren't literal instruction to do X, Y, or Z. They were actually opening up my head to something that's bigger than just yeah. a simple action. So when you were saying before about, you know, give us the hard theological nuts to crack, I, I gotta say the easy stuff probably is. Um, yeah. When you really break down what, it means for us to love our neighbor as ourself. When we read the parable of the good Samaritan or, you know, one that I was reflecting on just the other day, the prodigal son. Yeah. I mean, I mean, how fair is that? You right. know, the, the, the workers who, you know, start early in the morning and the ones that come later get paid the same. Yeah. These are, these are hard. Yeah. Um, and so I started to see that this is what, not just about, paying people wages and being kind when someone does the wrong thing and nicks off and squanders their inheritance. This was opening up, you know, this whole idea of what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of heaven? Um, it is like this. And rather than being again, um, this place in the sweet by and by that I go when I die, suddenly it was the kingdom of God is now it's here. It's within you. It's among us. Yeah. Um, and so these stories were for now, they were for putting into action. Now it wasn't about earning a ticket. It right. was about creating the place where people want to be. Yes. Um, so they can be in the presence of God. So, um, Jesus, uh, really took on that, um, that persona, I suppose, of, of being the master teacher who was more, interested in reshaping my reality to what is real yeah as a, then just getting me to do the right thing yeah um and and toe the line uh you know when i the year 10s we talk about the ten commandments and we break them down into you know 
six and four, these four relate to you and God, these six relate to you and others. And then we sort of bring it back again and say, what did Jesus do? Love God, love your neighbor. Um, but then an all loving God, loving neighbor fulfills all the law. Mm. Um, but how crap are we at it? You know, mm. really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, how bad are we at it? Um, and the more I reflect on it, the more I realize I often use a hashtag. It's not rocket science. Yeah. But boy, it's hard. Right. Um, you know, going across the street for my morning run and there's Steve camped outside of the Seven Eleven, And I go, oh, I didn't bring my card with me today. I'm going to have to ruin my whole day by going home and getting my card and coming <laughs> back and buying this guy a coffee and a muffin for breakfast. It's, it sounds so simple and it sounds so um, trite. But that's the real stuff of life. Yeah. Because it's, it's about relationship. It's about caring for somebody else. It's about understanding that um, uh, a beautiful Catholic priest here in Australia by the name of Father Bob Maguire, who's based in Melbourne, absolute legend. Um, mm. He's done some amazing stuff over the years. He's in his 80s uh, now. Um, he says all the time, I, I am because we are. Yeah, I like that. Um, which is that Umbutu uh, thing from Af uh, those African tribes that have this thing called Umbutu. I am because we are. Mm. And so if Steve goes hungry tomorrow morning, we are. Yeah. Um, and I've got to wear that. Yes. That's hard. Yeah. And that's like, I love the idea of that because you are, I forget where I picked this up, but I, I talk a lot about in our uh, church community about participating in the ongoing healing of the world. Yeah. And that is what it means. Participating in the ongoing healing of the world means Steve gets fed. It means that we, it, it, and once again, I love the panentheism I, language and the ideas because it's like, now I don't see anything as separate from myself. I'm mm. looking, I'm looking at this person, not only is there Jesus, but that's me, you know, that's me sitting there that's hungry in, in a sense, yeah. you know? Um, and I love that participating in the ongoing healing. That's, uh, Jesus, like I bringing that back to like following and Jesus, Jesus, I think in a lot of ways was inaugurating that sort of like, this is what holistic life looks like. This is what yes. ongoing, uh, healing. This the is fullness. what, yep. yes, I love Luke four, you know, and he's like quotes Isaiah, you know, and he's like, this is what it looks like, you know? Um, that the eyes would be, uh, the blind would see and the lame would walk and all of these things. It's like complete wholeness. It's be perfect as I am perfect, which is better translation, complete, be complete in, in this sort of way. Um, yeah. and, and so I've reevaluated Jesus to the point to where it's like, man, what a master at this to live a particular way to see exactly what that gentleman was talking about. It was, it was named father, uh, want to give him honor what was his name father oh, father bob yes father, father bob, bob that to, to, to reflect on that uh, how does that work uh with people that you're working with maybe whether in the chaplaincy in in the school or not that maybe have a, a real uh maybe off putness to jesus and to some of the language that surrounds some of this um how does that work to re phrase or to re-articulate in ways that makes this attractive or to get their mind thinking in other ways like how has that been because once again a lot of the deconstruction movement a lot has to do with language we don't want to quote follow jesus anymore you know like it took me a long time oh until about a year ago that i was really okay with the notion of that language of quote following jesus you know but now i i i, I love it on a lot of different levels because i believe he's led the way for for universal reconciliation essentially if you want to get really big about it but yep. my question is is with your work and a lot of the things that you do especially uh with blogging and stuff how do you navigate some of the language in helping people come on board to seeing this new view essentially so look a couple of ways that i can respond to that first of all um we start with the premise that um, what can you believe now about Jesus? Um, so the, the angle we take is if you, um, if you can't believe that Jesus walked on water or that he's son of God or that 
um, you know, you turn water into wine and whatever else, that's okay. What can you believe right now? And so we do a unit in year 10 where we specifically look at Jesus, the historical figure that Jesus actually existed because most kids come from the, they've been told, oh, it's a fairy tale. It's made up. Yeah, someone yeah. just wrote, someone wrote the whole Bible to, you know, <laughs> right. take, over, take over the world and control people's minds. Um, so uh, once they understand that Jesus was a historical figure and say, all right. And so we do another unit with our year 11s where we, uh, the very first lesson on this unit, which is how to read the Bible well, um, I'll talk to them about Aesop's fables and share some Aesop's fables and say, all right, so are these stories true? Mm. And all of a sudden, this idea of what is true shifts. True doesn't have to mean factual necessarily. Right. Um, because while there are turtles and rabbits, they generally don't race each other um, on a regular basis and challenge each other to, to running races. So, um, but there's, there's truth in the story despite yeah. that. And like so that. the angle we take is, all right, well, if you can believe that Jesus was a teacher who told wisdom stories, what wisdom can you glean from this? Um, and in fact, in the last couple of years, Peter Enns, uh, in his latest book, uh, talks about that a lot, that, you know, mm. the Bible is in a book of answers. It's a book of wisdom. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if we can read the Bible seeking wisdom. And so when we understand Jesus as someone from whom we can gain wisdom, it doesn't matter whether he's son of God or not. Now, I say that to mean, um, I mean, there'd be some, possibly some Christians listening to this going, oh, how dare right. you heretic. But, but what I'm saying <laughs> is, is that um, for somebody who's completely blocked off to Jesus simply because of the son of God thing, man, they'll, they'll find value in scripture if you can get them to understand that Jesus' teaching was about a change of paradigm. Yeah. And maybe through that change of paradigm, I mean, I, just this morning in my Monk in Docs reflection uh, on Instagram, I, I talked about how, you know, we need to see um, God in all things, even in the spaces between us. Um, yeah. And so when we can start to, maybe if we start to put some of those things in action, some of this teaching, bringing about the kingdom of God, um, maybe we'll start to see God. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's what our, well, not just young people, but people in the world need to see. Yeah. Um, you know, we, well, I believe in God. What does that God look like? Well, let me show you what that God looks like by loving you. Yeah. And maybe someone who says, well, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. Jesus said, you know, love my neighbor and love my neighbor. And suddenly they see what this God is love thing is through the yeah. action of loving their neighbor. Yeah. Um, so that'd be the first thing. The other big one for me um, is, you know, every week in a lot of traditional churches, they recite the Lord's prayer. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sitting down with, with students again, as I do and, and other people from time to time, but um, saying to them, listen, <clears throat> when we pray, your kingdom come. The next line is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, what does heaven look like? Um, and again, it's not about the, what's going to be like when we die. But even if it were, what would you imagine a heaven would look like? Well, there would be no sadness. There'd be no, I mean, we can look at revelation. There's no sadness. There's no sickness. There's no, right. So, so how about we start acting about and doing things that are going to help to bring that about, to help yeah. bring about the kingdom of God. Yeah. Um, so I guess they're two very basic, but probably the most prominent approaches. And there's a lot of more intricacies in those, but I think if we open up uh, Jesus like that to people, you know, simply getting past the, well, it's one of the reasons why, and you might do this too, when you're first introduced to people, I say, oh, hi, you know, I'm Mark, or I'm such and such. Oh, what do you do, Mark? <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> because the second, the second I say I'm a chaplain or a pastor or a minister, um, they are going to think that they know yeah. what I believe and where I stand on things. And I actually did a whole message on this for our staff um, in the school last year where I had this list at the start of my sermon. I talked about what God might be like, um, yeah. but this list at the start of my sermon, you know, I had this whole list of stuff. I say, when I say, when you know me as a chaplain, here's possibly what you think I believe, but that's not where I stand on those things at all. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what we the struggle with Jesus is that, people think they got Jesus worked out. Well, what if Jesus weren't like you think Jesus was? 
And what yeah. if Jesus had something valuable to say anyway, if we can start there? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's getting, you know, the, the whole believing, behaving, belonging, you know, which comes first. It doesn't matter. Right. If, if someone says, you know, I'm going to listen to the, I'm find the wisdom in this and put it into practice. Maybe just maybe, um, if it, it's going to make their life better because they'll become more in the image that God has created them to be, whether they know it or not. Right. Um, right. I know that that bugs a lot of Christians. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'm be, with you. Becoming more in the image of who they are, even though they don't realize it. Um, yeah. But that, that opens up that possibility right. of Jesus and God becoming more to them than what they think of them now. Yeah. And even so much more tangible, I think, in a lot of ways. Like yeah. a lot of times I'll have conversations with people who don't really uh, follow the Christian tradition or have a, uh, any sort of relationship to Jesus or with or whatever. And we'll have these conversations and they're like, yeah, well, I don't have these. I don't remember having conversations with my Christian friends like this, you know, and we have this, we resonate on such a level and able to use different language. And then I remember most recently I was having... <clears throat> talk with a friend who is uh, very much more into um, different versions of spirituality. And she was like, why, it, why are you boxing yourself into the Jesus tradition? And I said, well, for a lot of different reasons. I mean, one, I was born in the United States. Uh, I was born to a pastor as a pastor's kid. I mean, there's a lot of things that were predetermined for me to, to be in this, you know, uh, yeah. but also too, like there's a lot of <laughs> wisdom that comes in these teachings, regardless if they're historical documents or not, neither here nor there, there's wisdom there. And I said, what's even more so is this spirit of Christ that seems to be transcendent right. whenever we do it and also talk about it and what's happening right now. I was able to say, do we feel, do you feel and sense what's happening right now in this conversation, this mutually beneficial, higher consciousness awareness that's happening through this dialogue in this way. And I'm yeah. like, this is Christ embodied right here and right now. This is it. This is, right. this is a, I mean, there's, there's a lot, a myriad of things. This is a, a form of many of it, you know, and that right yep. there is such an eye opener for people who are frustrated with the church, frustrated with Jesus, or don't have a context for Jesus to be like, Oh, like, I can, it transcends language, words, ideas, thoughts, doctrines, and it's two human beings coming into a, a form of union with the God that is right here, right now. And it's it's beautiful thing to see people now have a different view about what the possibility of Christianity could be like, because having been in the presence of an experience with someone who is willing to level with them on a different level of just like, oh, well, you got to believe that Jesus is the son of God before that, 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 you know, or yeah. you have to speak in tongues first, or you got to, you know, and yeah. to me, it's like, that is such an amazing thing for people to understand. And I love that about what you're saying is like, what's the most, uh, if you're, if you are incorporating Jesus into your spiritual practice and formation in life, what are the things that you can believe? And for this individual mm -hmm. person, it was like this experience. I can believe that this is true. And therefore we've had numerous conversations thereafter. So I, I love that. Uh, and I, I feel like so many people in the deconstructionist movement could use that right now. Absolutely. Uh, and I guess it's the thing, you know, a lot of, there's a guy on Twitter that I have talked to a lot in the past and he really struggles because he, he, he's come from a Christian background and now he would probably term himself more atheist than Christian, but he still sees this thing in the Jesus story. And, uh, yeah. and I said to him, well, well, we'll start where you can, mate. You know, yeah. just, um, okay, so you're at a point where you don't think the miracles happen and whatever else, that's great, but what value is there in Jesus? And, mm -hmm. I, you know, that's interesting when you think about it, the emphasis that we've placed on things over the years, I think the, the, those of us who've been through that deconstruction and reconstruction process um, have realized that the miracles themselves aren't necessarily 
the big Yahoo. Right. Um, I mean, one of my favorite stories is the turning of the water into wine. And I remember reading uh, one of those, you know, courses that, you know, in, teach people about the Christian faith. And that story was used as a way of saying Jesus was all powerful over nature. This is a story that tells us Jesus has power over nature. And I'm like, yeah. that's great. And then, you know, studying the background, realized that actually what Jesus did was saved a family from this um, community humiliation mm. and ostracization because they didn't provide for the party like someone who provided a party like that should have. Wow. Um, that this was about social and community. Yeah. Um, that, you know, this whole, uh, this father of the bride and the, the bride and her family and then the, the groom and his family would have been all at various levels known as the family who, you know, failed mm. to, um, to, to, provide a good party for their daughter's wedding. Um, yeah. yeah. Jesus came and saved the day. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't just about getting the party started again. It was about creating an, a situation where this, and I guess my two big things are, you know, what's Mark's thrust in a nutshell. One is helping people see that belief is believable. Yeah. And then the second one is, is that um, community over individualism. Mm. And so that, you know, Jesus was all about community. So he was all about, I mean, everything he did was about helping people in community. Sure. He healed that man's arm and healed that leprosy, but it was about creating an environment where they could have community. Yes. Again, they weren't ostracized. They weren't on the fringes. They were able to be a part of it again. And, and that's where the wholeness comes. The wholeness comes when we become whole. Um, yeah. You know, going back to that whole, I am because we are. Um, yes. Again. Yes. I am because we are. I love that so much. So much. Cheers, uh, Father Bob. <laughs> yes. Father Bob is the man. He is the man. <laughs> oh, if anybody hears any uh, uh, yard work happening outside, uh, that's apartment life happening on my end. So I apologize for any you know, weed eater noises or anything. But uh <laughs> That's how we go. Um, so as people, as we wrap up the, the show, I'm curious, uh, you know, I love you. You made that, you know, talk about what you're about, kind of what your, your thing is, what about the, the work that you're doing and all of this. And I love the, the language of the, uh, you know, the monastic stuff. Um, how could people get in touch with what you're doing? If you were to just give a quick little overview about like, the, the work that you're producing for people, if people want to get in touch with that or involved in that, what would they be? What's a flavor of that and how can they get in touch with it? So the best place at the moment would probably be um, through Instagram uh, okay. at Monk in Docs, M-O-N-K-I-N-D-O-C-S because um, I'm a monk who happens to wear docs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, that's probably the best place. There, there are a couple of other things that I am working on at the moment and they've been a long time coming some of them um looking at a podcast that uh, reflects on um spiritual practice and and building community mm -hmm. um and uh i do a bit of writing over at medium but the link for that's always in the bio of um of the uh the monk and docs instagram page uh a daily reflection goes out from there but if people want to touch base and talk and um and, and connect very happy to do that through the dms and um and we can expand into whatever else we need to later on yeah um so yeah it, it's it's i'm in an interesting position at the moment it, it's i've always had a few projects going on with stuff i mean the, the the original modern monk project had a full blog and um we're looking at doing a podcast at the time and stuff um uh, but for various reasons i i let that go i'm also on twitter at monk and docs as well although at the moment all you're going to see going up is the daily instagram post because i sort of signed out of twitter for for advent just felt it was time to take a breather out of there it's a weird space yes. sometimes so yeah some um, and by sometimes i mean all the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> you will but not find me in the twitter I'm, land really <laughs> it's like <laughs> well, that's, well that's it that's why i say instagram connect there because the likelihood at this point is i probably won't go back um yeah. i don't think um suck your life away so oh, uh, uh that, yeah, that's probably it, the best way um is to connect that way um and yeah th there's a few i mean any projects that you know i've been working on i, don't, I won't see too much because some of them may not come about one of these crazy guys who has more ideas before breakfast than 
some people do in a lifetime and I don't know what to do with them oh, sometimes. Yeah. But, so um, I feel that for me, man. <laughs> yeah. So, but so Instagram, uh, I'm happy to receive DMS and, and questions that way. Um, and like I said, we can expand out to email or other things and, um, yeah, a few writing projects and maybe a podcast on the ball, but it'll be announced through the Instagram. So that's probably the best place for now. Awesome. Absolutely. Awesome. Is uh, any final parting, just a word of wisdom for those who may be going through deconstruction and finding their way into reconstruction? Yeah. Um, it's okay. Mm. It's okay. I don't, I think one of the big things that I hear from people who are going through this when they're talking to me about it is that feeling of uh, guilt, shame. Mm. Um, as for many people, it's very real ostracization from family and community. Um, but I would say it, it, what you're doing is okay. It's not wrong. It's not bad. Mm. Um, and I would really encourage you to reach out to someone, whether it's people like Luke or myself or other people that you can find um, closer to home if, if you need that. But people that you can uh, vent spleen with and talk things out with, not and not people who are going to tell you. Um, and that'd be the other thing I'd say is it's your journey. Mm. Um, so you may not find answers to many of your questions. Um, and that's okay too, but, but hang in with it. Um, yeah. Take your time, stead, tread carefully, seek wisdom where you need it. And um, may God be with you and know yeah. that, know yeah. that no matter how you're feeling or however, together or ostracized or whatever you feel God's there with you in that. And when I say with you, not just present, but feeling all those things. Yeah. Um, experiencing it with you in that moment. Mm. That's so good. Thank you, Mark, so much. Pleasure, Wise man. Words. We'll have to do this again sometime. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And um, absolutely friends, give, give Mark a follow, connect with him. Uh, if any of this sparked that you want to talk about further, certainly reach out to either of us. And yeah. uh, we're all about community. That's hopefully you've heard that through the thread of this and uh, want to make ourselves available because we need more people to, to journey with. So thank you, friends. I guess that's, yeah, that's the thing. You know, the, the chaplaincy thing, I find that happening online a lot. Yeah. Uh, and, you yes. probably, and you probably do too. Yeah. Um, so when I say, you know, reach out, yeah, the, the Lukes and the, the Marks and there are other people out there too. Re yeah. Reach out. We, we want to journey with you because uh, we actually do care. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and that's, um, that's the yeah. we. That's the we, right? That's it. That's that it. is it. So good, man. Thank you so much. My pleasure.